Good day and welcome to the desk side briefing by ASTO. Today's call is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Jim Blumenstock, Senior Vice President of Pandemic Response and Recovery. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Shelby. And again, thank you all so much for joining us today to hear from three of the nation's public health experts on what their jurisdictions and public health agencies are currently, currently focusing on in their COVID response efforts, especially in light of the impacts of the Delta variant. Which we asked our try to schedule these periodic briefings to coincide with important events or milestones that would be of great interest to all. And this week is one of those times with CDC adjusting its masking guidance earlier this week, jurisdictions working to reopen schools safely for full-time in-classroom learning, and of course the ongoing efforts to raise vaccine confidence, acceptance, and access. In our multi-layered COVID prevention strategy, vaccination remains the most important way to beat down the pandemic. As you have heard before, and we'll hear again today from these three public health leaders, vaccination equals protection. When we go by the numbers with a week-on-week comparison, COVID cases are up 57%, hospitalizations are up 48%, and deaths are up 31%. Um, there is a bright light, though, here that as a positive indicator, with administering um, over 342 million doses of vaccine uh, that have been administered, that this basically reflects a 16% increase in vaccine doses administered compared to prior week's figures. While not as severe as, severe as what we saw during the previous peak of the pandemic, the numbers are now certainly going in the wrong direction and at a concerning pace. The Delta variant is driving these increases, necessitating aggressive action and, when indicated and supported by new information, modified mitigation approaches to stop the spread. These points and more will be addressed in greater detail in in the time we have together today. Now, allow me to introduce to you our panel. First, we have Dr. Narav Shah, who is the ASTO president and the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. He will be followed by Dr. Carol Rattay, Rattay, who is the Director of the Division of Public Health for the Delaware Health and Social Services Department. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Joseph Cantor, who is the State Health Officer of the Louisiana Department of Health. Um, and just as a note before we begin, um, Dr. Cantor has not yet joined us because duty calls, um, and we, he will be late, but we do expect him to join us within the hour. Each panelist will provide a brief um, set of prepared remarks in sequence, saving ample time for a moderated question and answer period afterwards. So with that, Dr. Shah, let me please turn to you to begin. Great. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Jim. Um, And to my colleagues in the media, thank you as well for your time in joining us this afternoon. As Jim mentioned, my name is Nirav Shah. I am the ASTO president and also have the privilege of serving as the director for the State of Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'd like to start this afternoon by setting the table as to where we are with respect to COVID-19. Historians of the pandemic will look back on where we are now and compare it against one year ago. And what they will see when they look at the present is an inflection point, a fork in the road. In both time periods, then and now, cases had increased or were increasing, and concern was literally in the air. Now, a year ago, masks were the coin of the realm, and variants were the stuff of virologist nightmares. Researchers were talking about variants, but the public wasn't. Today, it seems that every conversation public health officials have is noun, verb, and variant. But there's another thing that's different about now versus then. As Jim noted, we have remarkably effective vaccines. If only we could convince the remaining 30% or so of the population to take them. The movable middle that we've all been talking about for the past few weeks is moving, but it's moving more slowly than it did a few months ago. And the principal risk right now is that the variant will get to those folks before a vaccine does. Specifically, the Delta variant, with its higher viral loads, greater contagiousness, potentially faster spread, and possibly higher rates of breakthrough infection. The Delta variant alone adds urgency to our efforts and distinguishes this phase of the pandemic 
from all that came before it. Simply put, Delta is proving to be more wily and more formidable than all other strains. And as a result, in part, masks are still common currency, but in different ways from one year ago and in different places across the country. Amid all of this, there has been one thing that's been a constant, which is that vaccines work remarkably well. That remains true, and it's why vaccination remains a key area of focus for state health departments. Although the rate of vaccinations may have slowed somewhat, the efforts of state health departments to get folks vaccinated have not slowed one bit. Vaccines remain our North Star, and they remain one of our top priorities right now. They remain the key to getting our kids back in the classroom safely, reducing the demand for ICU beds that are worryingly starting to fill up in some places and returning us to, more, to normal. One of the things that our health department here in Maine, and I know others across the country are doing. Now joining is Joe Cantor into the conference call. Oh, great. Thank you. Hey, Joe, Dr. Cantor, good to, good to hear from you. Um, one of the things that the state of Maine is doing, and I know other health departments are doing, is taking time to do a deep analysis of who has not yet been vaccinated, why they have not yet been vaccinated, what messages may prompt them to get vaccinated, and what messengers they would like to hear those vaccines from. We're doing surveys, convening focus groups, and talking to people to find out what we can do to help get them there. That will be our work for the remaining part of the month and into the, into the fall. So with that, I'd like to close and turn things over to Dr. Rattay. Thank you, Dr. Carol, you As a state health official, pediatrician, and mom of school-aged children, it is critical that we get kids back into our schools this upcoming fall. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, remote learning highlighted inequities in education was detrimental to the educational attainment of students of all ages and exacerbated the mental health crises among children and adolescents. Schools and school-supported programs are fundamental to child and adolescent development and well-being in so many ways. Because the Delta variant is now the predominant circulating COVID strain and is so contagious, layered prevention strategies, including vaccinating eligible persons, use of face coverings, testing, symptom monitoring, and other setting-specific measures are even more important to reduce transmission among those in schools and during school-related activities, like the participation in indoor sports. Vaccination is the most important public health action to end the COVID-19 pandemic. And currently, a large portion of our school communities are not vaccinated and not eligible to be. But for those who are eligible, I cannot emphasize enough the importance of vaccination for those in the school setting. Getting more students and their families vaccinated will reduce the likelihood that any potential surge will disrupt learning again. In Delaware, we are working with our Department of Education and have pushed out communications to school administrators and athletic and performing arts leaders asking that they strongly convey the importance of vaccination to their school communities and hold back to school COVID vaccine events for staff, students, and their families. And because we know that some parents have concerns about the vaccine, we've launched an About the Science page on our COVID vaccine webpage to provide answers to frequently asked questions about the safety and science behind the vaccine. And since parents indicated they feel most comfortable getting children vaccinated by their pediatricians, we will continue to encourage parents to work with pediatricians to get children vaccinated before they return to school in the fall. But let me say a few words about masking in schools. Both the CDC and the AAP recommend universal indoor masking for all staff, students, and visitors to K through 12 schools, regardless of vaccination status. This, again, is because a large portion of students are not eligible to be vaccinated or have not yet been vac vaccinated, and also because the Delta variant is more contagious. In addition, schools may lack the resources to monitor vaccine status 
or enforce mask policies based on vaccine status. So at this time, because we want to have all students in school, all students and staff should wear masks while indoors in school. Now a word about testing. Routine testing is another important strategy for identifying and preventing the spread of COVID in our school communities. Frequent testing helps immediately identify COVID cases, prevent transmission, and keep schools open. In Delaware, we have announced a $15 million partnership with Kaidel Corporation to provide comprehensive COVID-19 testing, processing, and reporting in all Delaware schools. Kaidel will utilize rapid antigen tests to provide on-the-spot results in as little as 10 minutes. And while the availability of testing in schools is not new in Delaware, this service, which is free to schools and staff, is a complete turnkey solution taking the burden off of schools. In Delaware, in Delaware, we are proud that through testing, as well as our partnership of our school nurses, epidemiologists, and our contact tracers, we have seen very minimal spread of COVID in our schools. Every case of COVID among the school community that can be identified early means we are better able to keep kids in schools and keep the classrooms open. The bottom line is that children should return to full-time in-person learning in the fall with layered prevention strategies in place, which includes promoting vaccination for all eligible individuals, mask wearing indoors by all individuals aged two and older, regardless of vaccination status, and routine testing for unvaccinated persons. And now I'm going to hand the call over to Dr. Cantor from Louisiana. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Rowdy and, and Dr. Shaw, um, Jim from ASTO, and really the whole team for ASTO. Thanks so much for pulling this together and for everyone um, tuning in. And these are really, really um, important topics and um, not just public health issues or theoretical. I mean, these really are life and death issues we're talking about. And I think it's probably easy to forget if your state is not deeply surging right now, but we're still in the grips of a public health emergency. And I wanted to give a cautionary tale about what we are experiencing in Louisiana right now to illustrate that I'm the state health officer for the Louisiana Department of Health. I'm also a practicing ER doc, and both sides of my job have been quite um, quite busy um, the past couple of days, to, to say the least. Um, it's as bad now in Louisiana as it has ever been at any point during this pandemic. And I say that still with some degree of shock that we're back here. Uh, a lot of us, certainly myself included, did not think we would be back here, um, even with the vaccination coverage being relatively low. Um, we did not think at this, this far into the pandemic we would be right back here. It feels like we never left, unfortunately. And I want to tell you what's happening in Louisiana um, so that uh, people across the country can make the investments and double their attention um, as would be appropriate. We have, um, over the past four weeks, we have um, increased our hospitalization uh, COVID census by a factor of six. Uh, almost every hospital in the state now is canceling or postponing um, elective and non-emergent procedures. Uh, the majority of hospitals that we spoke to today are on diversion, which means that critical patients, COVID or non-COVID, in smaller hospitals that don't have the resources or expertise to treat them cannot be transferred in. It's very hard to get patients transferred in. Um, there are real morbidity and mortality consequences to that. Even just uh, canceling or postponing non-emergent procedures, most procedures that are non-emergent are only such for so long, and then they become emergent. And, and, and that's what we saw during the first wave when there was such disruption in healthcare. Louisiana is leading the country in new cases, and even more concerning than the actual number now is the trajectory. And we have gone pretty straight up when you look at our graphs, both for hospitalizations, COVID-like illness presenting in the emergency departments, and new cases over the past three weeks, and there's a lack of reliable modeling. Nobody really knows how to model Delta appropriately. So it's difficult to project how high we're going to get and how long we're going to be in this. It's not a comforting place to be. Um, 
at any point, and, and this is not the first time that we've been in this position, particularly down here in Louisiana, these difficult choices that hospitals are making now of canceling procedures or not taking in new patients uh, have, have real consequences, even if they're not easy to measure, and I really can't stress that enough. Um, let this be a cautionary tale right now. Um, yes, Louisiana is relatively low on our vaccination rates right now. We have 41.5% of the state's general population having at least initiated the vaccine series, and that puts us in the bottom five of states. But there are a lot of states that are within a couple percentage points of us, two or three percentage points of us, and I don't think that those additional percentage points are enough protection to ward against a spike like this. As has been mentioned um, twice since I joined this call, Delta is different. The transmission dynamics are different. The level of viral load that we presume to be in infected people is different. And most concerning right now, it seems like the viral load is, is, is equally high, we think, in people who are fully vaccinated. They will be protected against the most severe consequences. But in terms of reducing transmission, it makes it very, very challenging. Delta is different, and we need to be acting different. Um, if your state is considering ramping down their emergency declarations, if they're considering um, scaling back the response, I would caution against that, or at least leave it in warm status and not cold status, because um, the Delta variant is something we have not dealt with before. The transmission dynamics are very, very different, and we are not out of the woods yet, even if it might seem that way in your state, because it seemed that way here just a month ago. If there's ever any silver lining here, I'll, I'll tell you that, understandably, our vaccination rates have increased dramatically um, the past couple weeks. Last week, we doubled the number of people who initiated the vaccine series, new initiation administrations, and this week we're on pace to double that number again. So we're on pace to quadruple our rate of vaccinations over two weeks. I will tell you, every single one of those people who rushed to get vaccinated these two weeks wished they had done so five weeks ago. But please take that message and spread it. We, we, we have excellent protections against the worst consequences that even Delta can bring. There's no guarantee that future variants will provide us that opportunity. Despite all the transmission dynamics, this vaccine remains a good match for Delta, remains good protection against severe disease. And I think the more that we can continue on this push and remind our stakeholders that we are not out of the woods yet, even if you think you can see daylight, we're still in this thing, I think it, it will pay dividends and save some lives down the road. Uh, Nirav, Jim, I'm gonna pause there and I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Great. Dr. Shah, uh, or Dr. Gute and Cancer, thank you so very much for your, um, for your brief remarks. Um, excellent updates, illustrations, and certainly powerful messaging around public health in action and also how this is a, an all of community, all of society response to beat down Delta. So with that, Shelby, let's, um, let's open up for questions with our colleagues from the press. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. A voice prompt on the phone line will indicate when your line is open. Please state your name and media outlet before posing your question. Again, please press star one to ask a question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone an opportunity to signal for questions. We'll take our first question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Dan Goldberg from Politico. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Um, this question is for actually all three of you. Uh, the CDC obviously uh, changed its recommendations this week, and I'm curious how that's, that's playing in your state. Um, are, are, is there any evidence that, that more people are wearing masks um, and, or, and following these guidelines? Uh, and, and if not, um, what, what are the next steps beyond that that are, that are practical? 
Sure, I can. Thanks, Dan. Uh, this is Nirav. I'll go ahead and start, uh, and then, of course, invite uh, Dr. Rate and Dr. Canner to weigh in. Um, here in Maine, uh, after reviewing the recently revised recommendations, uh, which, again, were a function largely of the Delta variant, uh, we have recommended that people in Maine follow those recommendations for counties where there is high or substantial transmission. Uh, we made that recommendation publicly yesterday, so it's too early to tell what impact it may have had uh, on vaccinated individuals now picking up their masks and wearing them in indoor public settings. Here in Maine, um, if, of the counties that were affected, uh, it was a small slice of our population. Uh, you know, right now there's only one county in Maine uh, that, that was in that high or substantial transmission category. It's a small county, uh, just a couple of thousand folks who are vaccinated in it. So it, it did not have widespread impact in Maine, but thankfully, because Maine people have done a great job getting vaccinated, so it's too early for me to comment on what impact it might have. And similarly, I'm not sure what might come next. Uh, you know, the, the, the topic or the, the hidden question behind your question is, I think, uh, does this portend anything about the future of, say, a resurgent mask mandate? And I don't know that we're there in, in large part because of the presence of vaccines. Again, vaccines are where the focus is. Masks are a helpful adjunct to that. But that's a way in which we are much different from one year ago when masks were the mainstay. Over. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Tay. Yeah, so, you know, in Delaware, we're constantly evaluating our data, monitoring science, determine what responses are needed uh, given the emerging evidence. And not only is it important that we do evolve our approach based on the evolving science and characteristics of the circulating strains, but also important that we assess what is happening on the ground in our communities. Um, so I will tell you, while um, uh, our the, um, case rates are um, relatively low, not as high as in any of our vaccine rates are um, also higher than in many other parts of the country, uh, we still have concerns. And I think all of the um, activities over the last week, but especially since CDC announcement on Tuesday, um, has led to we've seen an uptick in testing, an uptick in vaccination, and being out and about, I'm seeing more people wearing masks, whereas in the last few weeks um, uh, previously, uh, we really have no. Thank you. And Dr. Cantor. Yeah. Dan, th thanks for the question. I think the CDC got it right. And, and look, the CDC is experiencing this pandemic in real time, just like the rest of us are. And I, I think folks need to take some perspective. I know there's been a lot of chatter the past week on it, but look, it's a lot easier to get on TV if you have something negative to say about it. it you know, that's just the way it goes, so those voices rise up. Um, we had actually gotten out ahead of the CDC in Louisiana, and last Friday we came out with a universal mask recommendation for vaccinated and unvaccinated, particularly because of those transmission dynamics in Delta that we're seeing. We, we are seeing breakthrough cases. We are seeing transmission between people who are fully vaccinated. Again, they're usually well protected against severe disease, but we are seeing that transmission. And in the context of a surge, it made sense to make masking uh, universally recommended. The larger paradigm that the CDC hit on, I think is absolutely accurate and what is needed right now. And that is that the recommendations of what mitigating measures are likely appropriate should change based on the facts on the ground. And if your locality or state is doing well at that point in time, it's probably okay to loosen up mitigation measures. When you begin to spike or see signs that's prompting that's coming, then you need to buckle down again, mask again, distance again. Um, and that's what the CDC's framework that they put out allows for. It, it allows for a scaled mitigation response depending on what's happening in your particular place of residence. And I think that makes a lot of sense going forward. Thank you all. Shelby, next question. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. 
Yes, this is Pat Eaton, Rob from the Associated Press. Um, maybe Dr. Rate would be best for this. There seems to be a lot of pushback to the um, to, to the CDC's recommendations for masks in schools. I'm hearing from these groups who say, "Well, I think my kid's more likely to get a disease from the mask and dropping it and picking it up or whatever than they are from uh, the, the dangers of COVID, and they need the social cues and that stuff um, that come with that not wearing a mask." What what do you say to these people? How do you how do you respond to 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 those people? Yeah, so the science is is clear that masks are extremely helpful in preventing the spread of COVID nineteen. Here in Delaware, we saw almost no spread of COVID nineteen last year, and we had kids three feet apart um, the whole year. We began having them sitting closer in buses at the end of the year, and we believe that masks were the critical um, tool in our toolbox to really help kids be safe in school. Um, masks are safe. Uh, we know that there are rumors out there, um, uh, some, um, you know, science that's not uh, peer-reviewed and, and credible science that might suggest that uh, masks are unsafe, but there really is no um, solid or credible evidence that masks are unsafe for kids. I can tell you having two kids myself in school, um, they don't care. They just wear them. They wear them when they need to, and it really doesn't impact them. But if we want to have kids in school this this fall and as many kids as we possibly can get into school masks are a key component to getting kids back into school dr t thank you um dr shaw or dr Cantor, anything more to add no nothing else for me jim okay great then shelby let's go to the next question please we'll take our next question caller please go ahead Hi, my name is Deborah Netburn. I'm a reporter at the Los Angeles Times. And, um, you know, the more I report on the Delta variant, um, frankly, the more worried I am that schools are not going to open in the fall. And I'm just wondering, I mean, how much do we know about how effective masks are against the Delta variant, which just seems so much more transmissible, you know, than previous strains, right? And I, I just recently saw this report it was modeling and I, I know someone said that maybe we can't model delta very well yet but that like if if kids aren't wearing masks in school 70 percent of kids are likely to get infected and even with masks 40 percent of kids are likely to be infected um i know there's a big difference in those numbers but i'm just wondering how parents are going to parse that out sure, I can, great I, I can yeah, I can I can go ahead and start, but then uh, Dr. Rate and Dr. Tanner, please weigh in. Uh, you know that, that's a, that's a question that that's come up here, and, we, and we've we've looked into it as well. And what we've what we've seen um, based on where we are today, uh, Delta exerts its greater contagiousness and its greater virulence based on what it does after it gets in the body. But first, of course, it's got to get in the body, and in order to do so, it's got to hitch a ride with a water droplet or an aerosol as it travels through the air into someone's nasal passages. And what the masks do is prevent that piece. They remain exquisitely good at reducing the amount of aerosol or droplets that, are, that come out of our mouths during normal everyday coughing, talking, and laughing. And as a result of blocking those aerosol droplets, they reduce the likelihood that one of those droplets might have a Delta variant hitching a ride on it. And so I have not seen any data personally to suggest that masking is any less effective in the face of the Delta variant. However, one of the concerns about the Delta variant is that a smaller dose could lead to a very high expansion in the number of viruses. That's a theoretical concern. Again, I haven't seen any concrete clinical or epidemiological data that calls into question the utility of masking in the face of the Delta variant. But Dr. Rattay, Dr. Cantor, please please weigh in. Sure. I'll go ahead and jump in. This is this is a joke, and I completely agree with that. 
look, I mean, it's going to take some time. You know, if if someone wants is, is holding out for a finite percentage of how much masking uh, is protective in Delta compared to Alpha or the other variants, that data is going to take some time. But there's no question that if the intent of a community is to bring their students back for in-person learning without keeping half the school out, if that is the intent, the single thing that they can do now to make that as safe as possible is universal masking in the school setting. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And we'll get the precise data, you know, as it comes in, as it becomes available. Thank you. And Dr. Rattay. Those were great explanations, great, great answers. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Great, thanks. And, you know, just the one point that I'd like to just, just reinforce that, um, you know, in the context of a safe school environment, it's all the layers of the mitigation strategy that add up to providing that safe environment. So in addition to vaccination and masking, you have other features, you know, such as distancing, personal hygiene, environmental controls, testing, the capacity for rapid case identification and outbreak response. So if there is illness in the school, it can be um, identified and tamped down as quickly as possible. So I just want to reinforce that all of those really contribute to the environment that we're striving for as far as 100% in-class opening um, this school year. So thanks. Shelby, next question, please. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, Rebecca Torrance, Bloomberg News. Thank you so much for taking my question. This question is for all three of you regarding breakthrough infections. Um, so the CDC has rolled back tracking requirements that the states only have to report breakthrough infections that result in hospitalizations or deaths. But of course, now that we have evidence that vaccinated individuals can transmit the virus pretty reliably, um, that rollback seems a bit mature. Uh, a bit premature. Um, how are each of your states tracking breakthrough infections, and do you think the CDC should shift their guidelines back to requiring all breakthrough infections to be reported so we get real-time national data on the issue? Thank you. Sure. I can I can go ahead and start, um, and then again, as you noted, I'll invite my colleagues to. Uh, you know, we, we here in Maine are tracking a number of variables associated with breakthrough infections. Uh, because we do think it's important for states to continue this level of epidemiological analysis. So not only are we tracking the number of infections, but we are tracking their symptomatic status, hospitalizations, deaths, whether they were a healthcare worker, whether they were a resident of a long-term care facility, whether they were part of an outbreak, as well as the typical epidemiological parameters we would capture, age, sex, residence, area of residence. Uh, we think that's important for a number of reasons, uh, but chief among them, I think, is first to inform our own policy. As we've talked about in light of the Delta variant, we want to be thoughtful, and the data are what allow us to do that. But the, the other is to maintain transparency about the possibility that a manor could be infected so we can communicate with that with their citizens and even possibly becoming ill despite being vaccinated. Uh, that transparency in telling people what we know is critical for us. Uh, states are doing that across the country, and, and that's why I feel confident that net of net, we have a good picture of what's going on with respect to the to breakthroughs. And Thank this you. Is Carol in Delaware, and um, we have uh, never stopped um, uh, collecting data on uh, breakthrough cases in addition to hospitalizations and deaths. As Dr. Shaw uh, feels in Maine, we also feel that it's important that we're able to have an understanding of um, how um, the circulating strains are behaving and um, how the vaccines are protecting individuals in our state. So um, we have continued to collect those data, and in our state would have no trouble, no problem with uh, 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 reporting that information back to the CDC again. Yeah, this is um, Joe Cantor saying here in Louisiana. You know, look, one of the challenges the CDC has is, you know, each 50 state has their own uh, specific flavor of health department, and some states even have multiple, multiple independent health departments within their state. And so they end up having a lot of disparate data um, thrown their way up to the CDC, and the CDC has to make sense. And there's, I think, still a lot of variability in 
exactly how states are tracking and sometimes what definitions are used, and just the, the nature of doing business in a very big country with, with 50 states. Um, much like um, much like what you just heard, same goes in Louisiana. We, we continue to track breakthroughs. We never stopped. We currently have 4,700 um, breakthrough cases of those. 260 have been hospitalized and 41 have died from COVID. So when you do the numbers here over the past week, just over 90% of our new cases were in people who were not yet fully vaccinated. 85% um, of our new deaths this past week were reported to us were in people not fully vaccinated. And of the 1,600 or so people hospitalized with COVID right now, about 89% are not fully vaccinated. I think the challenge is when you look at across states, there's still a lot of variability in how these measures are, are kind of being tracked, particularly for the cases. And the CDC is trying to put out measures that have as much uniformity as possible. Thank you all. Next question, Shelby. Thank you. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is Sarah Mervash with the New York Times. Thanks for taking our question. Um, I have a question about if any of the latest information changes what we know about how the, the virus affects kids with Delta in particular. So I guess this might be a question for Dr. Cantor and what you're seeing in Louisiana. Um, basically, are children just making up a growing portion of cases because more adults are vaccinated? Or is there an indication that Delta is actually more dangerous to kids? Yeah, great, great, and very timely question. Um, it's yes to both of those. And, and I'll tell you, the, the data is coming in fast and furious now, so I think it's going to take probably another few days, maybe a week, to get to get real precise numbers. But what we're seeing is, you know, obviously there there is a percentage, you know, the, of the average age in the hospital right now for COVID in Louisiana, um, the percent, the average age has gone down. And, and the two reasons for that, number one, as you point out, um, you know, we have many more of our elderly residents vaccinated, we've got 80% um, at least initiated of people over 65, so they're better protected. So that, that does skew the data as you allude to, but even taking percentages aside as a raw number, as an absolute number, we are seeing younger individuals and kids get sicker in higher numbers and get more severe disease with Delta than they have before. It's really challenging, I'll tell you, for our pediatric, for our children's hospitals because they're already battling a very unseasonal outbreak of RSV and parrot influenza. We've never seen this much RSV this early in the season before, so they're already very busy, um, and then they're seeing more sick kids. It makes it very challenging, particularly for children's hospitals right now. Dr. Cantor, thank you. Any others like to add to that? Then Shelby, next question, please. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, uh, this is Andy Kushner, a reporter with MarketWatch. Um, in, in the school setting, what do you think the prospect in the future is of vaccine mandates for the adult staff, teachers, et cetera, uh, and do you support them? Let's open it up to any panelists that would like to address that. I, I can start, and then uh, Dr. Rattay, if, if, you, if you want to weigh in on this, even better. Uh, so, you know, in, I know your question is confined to schools, uh, although, uh, you know, it, it, right now it, it seems like even just today, uh, mandates are very much part of the national discussion uh, in terms of where we are with respect to COVID, and, and certainly uh, the president is making his announcements on this topic as well. But one or two quick notes on, on mandates uh, generally, and then I'll, I'll zero in on schools. When we think about mandates in public health, they are not the first tool we reach for, generally one of the latter tools. Of course, here when it comes to COVID vaccination, we've we've reached for a lot of tools initially, uh, education, persuasion, incentives, and now the discussion turning to mandates. Uh, the other consideration, and as, as elucidated by your question, is the relative value of targeted mandates versus general mandates. And as you note, uh, I think there's going to be more appetite and buy-in for targeted mandates, school staff, certain employees, things of that nature, frontline healthcare workers. Uh, in general, I, I think mandates do have a role in public health. Indeed, it's, you know, the, the goal of public health is to keep people safe and healthy. Mandates are one way that we can get there in the face of the pandemic. Uh, we in Maine have not had the conversation about mandates for school staff yet. 
we're thinking about other categories, for example, healthcare workers right now, uh, but we have not had the conversation about school staff. A critical question when it gets to mandates is what's the baseline, and if the baseline is already close to where you want it to be, you have to investigate whether targeted education, one-on-one conversations is the way to go rather than a mandate. Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, Dr. Sorte or Cantor, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I will just add, um, um, I'll reiterate, vaccination is the most important public health action to take to end this pandemic. And we all want this pandemic to end. We all also want our kids safely back in school. And um, we are not where we need to be in our state um, as far as um, vaccination. Uh, we're especially concerned about certain vulnerable um, populations. Uh, we're concerned about long-term care staff and therefore residents. Uh, we're concerned about young adults and our adolescent population not having the vaccination rates that we we need. And um, so, quite frankly, everything is on the table right now while we continue to evaluate the best approaches to increasing our vaccine rates. We also have not had the discussion in Delaware about mandatory vaccination for teachers and school staff. Um, We're going to continue to um, educate and incentivize individuals in our state um, to get vaccinated in hopes that uh, that will continue to drive our numbers up. But um, we want to end this pandemic. And uh, so, you know, we're really open to, I think, a lot of uh, different options as we move forward. Yeah, this Thank is, you. Um, Cantor, I, I agree with all that. You know, I'll just add, I think the language gets a little bit confusing. And, and I, th- I think a lot of the time what's being discussed is not actually, when you look at what a proposed policy is from a business or a school or um, anything else, it, it ends up not being a vaccine mandate. It ends up being a choice uh, between getting vaccinated or some other mitigation uh, protocol like serial testing. And to me, that that, that seems very reasonable. You you achieve the goal of providing a safe environment. You you, you maintain some choice in there. And, and clearly, most people are going to look at that and say um, it, it makes sense for them personally to get vaccinated given that context. I don't know if I would call that a mandate because people still have some degree of choice in there and the other objectives get to be fulfilled as well. This is Nero. I'd, I'd, I'd like to underscore and completely concur with Dr. Canner's point. Here in Maine, what we've talked about and had conversations with groups about is not mandates, but conditions of employment. Excellent. And a great clarification on that point. Um, show me next question. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is uh, Phil Galowitz with Kaiser Health News. Thanks for taking my question. Um, as there's concern as state officials, do you have concerns about the COVID vaccine immunity waning? And is there any discussions or what do you think of the idea of doing antibody testing on nursing home residents who got who were vaccinated back in December, January to see what levels uh, they have of the uh, COVID antibodies? Great. Thank you. We'll open that up. This is Cantor. I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, I do, but um, that's not what's keeping me up at night right now. Um, look, I, mean, not, I think all of those will come. You know, better guidance about what the real utility utility of serology or antibody tests are, that will come. Real finite guidance on who needs a booster shot and when, that will all come. And, uh, and there's no question about it, you know, whether it comes next week or next month or six months. It, it'll come. Um, the incremental percent decrease that one probably um, has, you know, with their protection weaning, we're talking about real incremental differences here. And let's just take a step back and compare this to the world of vaccines. Um, if you have a flu vaccine for a given year that's over 65% effective, that's a grand slam. And a lot of years, the flu vaccine doesn't hit that, doesn't come close to that. A lot of years, it doesn't come close to 50%. Still widely effective on a population basis. So even with some degree of wean, which, which, we, which we expected, um, these COVID vaccines remain remarkably effective. And booster shots will come, better guidance on who needs a serology test, when you check antibodies, which one you check, those will all come. But I, I don't think it changes anything of what we need to be doing right now, which primarily is increase 
the base of the generally vaccinated population. Phil, Phil this is near of, um, you know, I, I concur with Dr. Tanner. The, um, we're keeping, I'm keeping an eye on those data and those uh, out, of, out of my peripheral vision. Certainly last week, ACE, the U.S. CDC's advisory committee discussed the recent data and the most up-to-date data with respect to booster doses and revaccination in different populations. Uh, it, right now, much of the focus is on immunocompromised groups where there can be overlap in the population and long-term care. Uh, so as Dr. Canner notes, that discussion will continue and we are keeping close tabs on it. But to be candid with you, um, Right now, uh, I, I'm really focused on getting folks first doses rather than third doses. There will be the time for that, and we will be ready to do that. All states will be, as we were uh, this past December and January, but we've still got folks out there that haven't had their first dose. That's where a lot of our team's focus is. And in Delaware as well, um, certainly first doses and full vaccination uh, are, are priorities at this point. I don't think any of us will be surprised um, if and when there are recommendations for um, a booster dose. I can tell you uh, we are hearing a lot from our providers um, who wish to uh, give a booster to immunocompromised patients, and so we are eager to um, uh, to see how the, the data plays out and if there will be an EUA recommendation change uh, for immunocompromised people to get that dose sometime in the near future. Thank you. Shelby, next, please. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, this is Fran Chris from Very Well Health. Um, my question is how messaging might change. We're down to when we talk, uh, we talk, when you look at the Kaiser Family Foundation data, most people who were even saying they might get it, have, many of those have gotten a shot. Now you're at people who are pretty stuck, whether they're worried, whether their politics dictate that or whether they're worried about the safety, so that all of the messaging that's come before it um, hasn't worked up until now. So who are the messengers and what is the messaging? Even if we're not going to get to herd immunity, but if what your goal is, person by person in your states, three more people, four more people, protecting them, protecting who they're with, how are you changing your messaging and how are you changing your messengers? Sure, I can... I can. Oh, I'll, I can go ahead and start. We've um, This is Nira from Maine. We've... Uh, as I noted uh, at the top, we've been doing a deeper dive into this, gathering data from main specific surveys, focus groups, uh, and other channels to try to get a better sense of who is in that group that have not yet been vaccinated and what would compel them in that direction, what would move them uh, of their own accord to go and get a shot. And I'll, I'll answer, Fran, your question uh, in, in, on two axes. The first is the manner, in, the manner in which the message may change. And in this respect, I think it will change in a manner to be more responsive to concerns that we have elicited. For example, what we've found and seen in our survey data is one of the concerns among those who have not yet been vaccinated is a concern around side effects, both near-term side effects, they don't want to be out of work if they get their shot, as well as the longer-term side effects. We can do that. We've got now six, seven months of data around what we know about vaccines so we can be more concrete and granular in the way that we chat with folks that will be responsive to their concerns. The other is the messenger piece and a companion question of not just the messenger, but the where. Where would they like to get vaccinated? And what we've seen in the data so far in Maine is both the messenger that would compel them as well as the place they'd like to get vaccinated is their doctor's office. Um, and it, it's not surprising that folks who are concerned about side effects in the immediate term would want to get their shot in the presence of a doctor. So we're working now on changing that message and enlisting doctors to make it easy for folks to get their shots at a doctor's office. Thank you and so this much. is Carol in Delaware. Um, and we um, similarly are um, working very closely with our medical community. Uh, we're about to launch a, a provider toolkit um, early next week. Um, to support um, their um, uh, the different facets uh, or needs for them, whether it's about educating uh, patients or 
um, administration, reimbursement, um, ordering vaccine. We're trying to make it as simple as we can for our provider community to um, be a part of the solution. Um, additionally, um, and uh, we agree that the messenger part of this is really important. Um, we have now, um, we have a cadre of community health workers who have been on the ground uh, reaching out um, to individuals. We're um, closely using data uh, to geographically look at census tracts where we have under vaccination. And uh, now we're um, contracting with community-based organizations in those um, census tracts as well uh, to do some direct outreach. We know that um, having a trusted messenger is um, really key for individuals to feel comfortable, uh, for hesitant individuals to feel comfortable uh, with receiving the vaccine. Yeah, there's a um, – this is Cantor again. There's, there's a really, really good, um, good points. Um, I, I agree with all of them. I think they were said really well. You know, I would add, um, to, you know, message to people who are doing this work, to, to, to people who are engaged in vaccine campaigns, who are engaging in these conversations, who are organizing and, and trying to get the word out and reach people. Don't give up. There still is good progress um, to be had. And, and again, look, look at us in Louisiana. We're, we're, we're on track to quadruple our vaccine administrations in two weeks time and um, Fran you had used the word stuck I don't I don't think we're stuck you know I think there are a lot of people that will get vaccinated they just haven't done so yet and, and we still need to be working to find out uh, why that is try and, and bring question and doubt with fact and as was so eloquently said before work to get the right trusted messenger to do so and I think more and more we'll find that it's probably their clinician their, their doctor or their provider, but we're not stuck. I mean, the, the, the real recalcitrant voices, um, they're loud, but they're also the far, far minority here, and we really can't lose sight of that. Thank you all. Thank Shelby, you. next. Thank you. And again, that is star one to ask a question. We'll take our next question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, um, this is Mary Ellen McIntyre with CQ Roll Call. Um, thanks for taking my question. I wanted to follow up a little bit about, you know, the vaccine mandate um, that the president's post announced later and sort of this idea of either, you know, requiring employees or making, you know, it more difficult if they don't have the vaccine. Do you think, I feel optimistic that this is going to be, I guess, more successful in increasing vaccinations amongst people who haven't wanted to than some of the other incentives that um, we've seen states and local governments do taking over the past couple of months? I can go ahead and start. This is near. Um, you know, uh, Marilyn, with the, with the proviso that we haven't seen the president's plan yet, although I, I think I've seen some hints that it may be a, an attestation, less of a, you know, a mandate. Uh, I, I think moves in this direction are, are, are helpful um, for, for a few reasons. Uh, one is, again, they are conditions, and they do give people options. Uh, it's not as if you must do this. It's you have choices, and you've got to pick the path that's right for you. Uh, that, I think, empowers people at the same time we're nudging them in the direction that we'd like to go. The other reason I think in this part of the conversation around vaccines at this stage it's helpful is that it establishes a baseline. Right? It normalizes the activity, and I think if coupled with making vaccines really easy, for example, on-site vaccine clinics, things like that, by normalizing the baseline, you sort of solve the, the, the concern around people not knowing where to go, not knowing when to go. You make it the normal thing to do. Uh, there, there are, I think right now, with respect to vaccinations, of that 30% or so, the latest data that, the latest data that I've seen suggests that of that 30%, there are, we know not to treat them as a monolith. We get that. But in big picture terms, there are probably two groups there. There are those who haven't yet been vaccinated by choice and those who have not yet been vaccinated by chance. Uh, and mandates help both. For those who have not yet been vaccinated by chance, they've been busy, they haven't had the ability to find a vaccine spot, making it mandated or a condition of employment coupled with easy access helps that. And then for those who have not yet done so by choice, it puts the decision right in front of them. Some fraction will opt out, but I'm, I'm heartened by the fact that, for example, Methodist Hospital, 
which went in this direction in Houston, saw vanishingly few people ultimately say no. And I'll just add, uh, this is um, Carol from Delaware. Um, I'm glad, uh, very glad Dr. Can Cantor helped us kind of re reframe the way we're thinking about this because it's really not mandating vaccine, but it's really um, mandating, a, you know, a, a, that you need to choose an option. And the reality is if people do get tested on a weekly basis, that's certainly safer than having them not get tested on a weekly basis. Um, of course, we would love for everyone to be vaccinated, but if people aren't there yet, um, weekly testing um, that not only helps us, um, helps our states and our communities be safer, um, but it also uh, certainly um, provides an opportunity for counseling and education around the vaccine. Um, and we, as Dr. Shaw was was saying, you know, we're really trying to couple testing with with vaccination. So maybe somebody comes in for a weekly test three, four weeks in a row and talks to a nurse there, develops a relationship with them. And finally, on the fourth visit, they're like, all right, here's my arm. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, for those who um, may need a, a little bit more um, time to feel comfortable, this may be a good solution for them. Thank you, Dr. Rattay. So, Shelby, I believe we have time for our, our last quick question, if you may. We'll take our last question. Caller, please go ahead. Hi, it's Meg Terrell from CNBC. Um, a very quick two-parter, apologies. But um, just on that mandate question, how much do you worry that some proportion of the people who are not getting vaccinated by choice would dig their heels in and that the, you know, the get vaccinated or get tested very frequently could lead to backlash? And then that two, the second part of it is just how much would full approval make a difference in the conversations uh, folks are able to have about the vaccines? And how many people do you think that would win over? Hey, Meg, this is uh, Joe Kander. I'll, I'll jump in, even though you were sneaky with the real quick two-question part. Um, I think um, for the second part of the question, um, I think you get much more um, buy-in across the board when full approval happens, not for legal reasons. There doesn't seem to be any legal basis for, for differentiating this between an EUA or full approval, but it certainly is just more, more palatable for some people. Um, I mean, clearly, the you know the the, the federal court upheld um, the, the, the Methodist Hospital in Houston's um, uh, policies, and, and, and I think legally it doesn't make a difference. But but there is something to be said about full approval. And it seems to be important to some people just in the way they perceive this. So I do think once full approval happens, and you got to think it's coming soon with you know 340 million doses being administered across the country. You, you got to think it's coming soon. I do think you're going to see an increase in this. So the other part of your question about, um, you know, the blowback, um, look, there's blowback to all types of things that are important. There's blowback to the mask mandates. Um, there's, there's blowback to hospital policies restricting visitation. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if you are an organization, if you are an employer, if you are responsible for a body of people, you have to do what's right for their safety and for the safety of people that are going to come in contact with them, and that needs to take precedence over all other considerations. Great. Again, Meg and Dr. Cantor, thank you so much for grabbing that last question. Uh, unfortunately, our time together has come to an end, um, so I certainly hope that for our, our colleagues in the media and press corps, um, you found this beneficial. I certainly want to thank our three members who certainly represent um, 59 strong, the state and territorial health officials of our, of our great country, um, Dr. Narab Shah, Dr. Carol Rite, and Dr. Dr. Joe Cantor. Uh, I mean, to me, I think that there were, there were three takeaways that I heard loud and clear. Um, you know, number one, vaccination um, is safe, effective, um, and while not alone, it's certainly our best defense against the, uh, the pandemic, including the Delta variant. Um, the second takeaway is as conditions change and knowledge expands, so will our strategies, strategies tactics, um, messaging, and communications um, to just improve, uh, you know, the, the ongoing effort and campaign to, to protect health and wellness. And the last one is that this is a whole-of-community approach. 
I mean, we've talked about um, all levels of government. We've talked about industry. We've talked about the education center, all the way down to um, communities, neighborhoods, families, and individuals. Um, and I think that, that that is an extremely strong point to recognize that um, everyone has a role and, and, and a, a part to play in this effort and uh, following the strong leadership of the nation state public health departments and, and the three that you were introduced to today. Uh, I certainly you um, would agree with me um, that we have a strong campaign and it is truly public health in action as we continue um, in the weeks and months ahead. So with that, I do want to, again, thank you all for being part of this program. Uh, for, for our media colleagues, if you have additional questions, please feel free to correspond directly with Jane Esworthy, ASTO Senior Director of Public Relations at media at asto.org. That's media at asto.org. And again, a special thanks to all of you who participated, and um, please feel free to disconnect at this time. Have a good afternoon. This concludes today's call. Thank you for your participation.